Let me take you down because we're going to nothing to do with Liverpool, everything to do with Manchester. We are going back on today's Brazilian shirt name pod to May the 13th, 2012. In the light blue corner, Manchester City looking for their first league win in 44 years. In the other corner, Queen's Park Rangers battling against relegation. Surely they're going to roll over. Surely it's going to be a formality. Oh, no, it didn't turn out that way. What a 90 minutes. No, no, no. What a 95 minutes. And what a cultural context we have to talk about with me old marker, Uncle D to the world, Mr. Dot Nadebayo. And um, bringing in a bit of Cockney reality rather than that cluffy style of Midlands accent to proceedings is the one and only legendino Tim Vickery. And oh. we, we, we need some youth. We need some oh, youth. We need some youth. Pick because what, the like Utes, youth, youth. The Ute, well, the Utes were very, very important at this time. Oh, yeah. The Utes, they were, they, were, they were getting up to plenty of things, putting them on the we front pages, the putting on. themselves on the back pages. Yeah, we, we, we passed the baton on to them. And uh, today we're going to see if they picked it up and ran with it or if they just picked it up and dropped it, yeah? Remember the baton? We were there. They stand on the shoulders of giants. When this Utes, these Utes nowadays who are running football, are running fandom and doing a pretty good job, I must say. When we passed the baton on to them, it was based on the history of supporting football teams that went back to when they weren't even a twinkle in their parents' eyes. So youths, listen up. You're going to hear history. And remember that baton is going to be passed to you on this Brazilian shirt name podcast. I'll tell you what, Tim. It's not often the title race has gone down to the final day. This season seems to keep going on and 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 on. Even though Liverpool say that they've won it, everybody knows the season ain't over. It ain't over. It's not over like it was back in the day when Man City faced QPR on which day? In June, was it? May, May, May the 13th. May the 13th be with you. <laughs> it will be with us. And, and, and which year, Tim? 2012. 2012. So we're casting our minds back eight years. Uh, let me tell you what was in the charts eight years ago. The soundtrack, if you like, to one of the most amazing final day of the Premier League matches ever. Well... At number one, uh, you, you might want me to explain this a little bit for you. A beautiful lady by the name of Rita Ora, and it features Tiny Temper, and it's simply R.I.P. And, and we know that either Man City or QPR are going to rest in peace. When I say rest in peace, I mean R.I.P. Rewind it, please. And we'll go on to the other RIPs in a moment <laughs> or two. Uh, we'll, we'll go on to the other RIPs in a moment or two as well. So RIP Rita Ora featuring Tiny Temper. An amazing track in my view, Tim. Have you rinsed it out yet? Well, uh, I, I'm a bit old for all of this. I played them all back to back, the entire top 10 this morning. And uh, and my wife said, "Oh yeah, I like yeah, I like that one. I do spin into that one." And that said it all to me. And she said about like, every track, "Yeah, yeah, I like that one. I remember doing spin into that one." Uh, and that said it all. Oh, I'm I'm looking forward to your spirited defence of this 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 parade of dross. <laughs> that was harsh. That was harsh. Listen, it's not my fault if you're married to a younger woman. No, she, well, I'm, not, a, I'm not. I'm not. Well, a cooler woman. <laughs> a cooler woman. <laughs> a hipper woman. <laughs> a woman who goes with the times. It's not Never my fault. Never heard of a small faces. No. <laughs> it should be grounds for divorce. Found her playing a Queen record the other day. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> What do you think of your um, your pecs? You, you're you're displaying a little bit of um, body heat at the moment. I can see. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not I'm, I'm past my best. I think yeah. you know. 
oh, you know, I'm doing all right. Yeah, um, doing all right. Um, she, she, she seems happy with it. Yeah, she, she, she hasn't said, look, I don't want you embarrassing me when that Dawson bloke, you know, goes and takes <laughs> off his shirt and uh, shows everybody what a, what a man's like. You know, what a man. She hasn't said that to you. Then. Well, I, I do begin to hear things about, you know, going to the gym and I'm not, I'm not doing it. I can't do it. I will not do it. I can't be told what to do. Yeah, you're anti-authoritarian. You've told yeah, well, us that yeah, before. Yes, yes, yes can't it do stays it. with you, doesn't it? Yeah. So, so they didn't beat that anti-authoritarianism. Uh, anti mm -hmm. They didn't beat that anti-authoritarianism out of you. Authoritarianism? At even? Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I went to a you know, bog standard, mate. It I went to a, to, a, to a former secondary modern. You know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah. That is very good. I thought I went through harsh times <laughs> when I were a lad. When I were a lad. <laughs> oh, that's nothing. When I were a lad. <laughs> we didn't have shoes on our feet. Mm. Oh, that's nothing. When oh, I yeah, were lads, when we were lads, we certainly didn't didn't have uh, didn't have a top ten. It was entirely based around the requirements of people doing spinning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see where you're going with that, Tim. I but see go on, defend, defend this the, well, this this top ten that we have here. Or the, before the, the, I these... defend it, let's bring the younger in because I need some what we call a backative. You know, I need somebody who actually knows what's going on musically in the modern world. Uh, and it's our longtime uh, producer and referee to a certain extent puts me in check, puts you in check. And today he's put his shirt, well not on his body, he's put it somewhere else. Mark Machado, welcome to the Brazilian Chutney podcast again. It's good to be here as always. Um, can, can we talk about Rita Ora quickly? Um, yeah, R.I.P. Yeah, uh, so... so all the, let, let the axe drop on Rita Ora. So, so, so Rita Ora is from West London. Uh, so I was kind of aware of her just, you know, just before she, she became big. She used to work in a shoe shop on Portobello Road. Well, you knew her then, what you were aware of. No, I, di I didn't know her then, but I, people were talking about how there was a girl who had an amazing voice and people were, people were aware of her. I didn't know her. I can't, I can't claim to have known well, her. Why didn't you just go and pair, buy a pair of shoes? That would have been a nice chat up line for you. You know, like, oh, hello, I don't know who you are, uh, but I hear you've got a great voice. Meanwhile, could you sort me out with a pair of Air Force Ones whilst I'm here? That's well, a great that chat up line. The, the the thing is, Dalton, that was way too cool for me. I, I just don't have that kind of style and swagger that you you would you do to to be able to pull off moves no, like that. No, that's a legend, you know. Don't mix me up with a right. legend, you know. Look at his style. Look at his swagger when he wears those dark glasses. I'm not going to be buying Air Force Ones. A proper shoes, please. What's wrong with Air Force Ones? Please. That like, that iconic. Yeah, I mean, my my, it's my my big. This is another argument. This is another <laughs> rock I'm having with the with the wife. Dress sneakers. Yeah, no, yeah. like the ones that Zidane wears at the side of the face. It's horror. It's, it's, it's wrong. Dress, sneakers. Do you like, know if you want to do athletic activities, put on some, some, some trainers. But, you know, if you're in a suit, you know, just put on some proper shoes for no, crying no. out loud. What's, I just wasn't born for these times. I wasn't no, born for the times of dress, sneakers. The thing I wasn't is, born for this top ten. I, th I think you've got to blame Run DMC for the old dress, sneakers stuff. I oh, mean, yeah. they were telling us about, you know, Adidas. Well, and that, that like, way! Exactly. Yeah, I'd rather um, not. I'd rather walk properly in decent shoes. He doesn't get it, Mark. He doesn't get it. Doesn't get it. Um, okay. So Rita Ora, what, what, I, what really I think is really interesting about her is that she wasn't born in London. She came, she emigrated over, right? Her family emigrated over one of the former Yugoslavia uh, states. And I think it's... it's Island of immigrants. Island of immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> what we are. We can come to that in a moment. It, it's, it's, it on that William from Normandy bloke. But I think I think that's the whole point here, right? It's representative that you know the sand. One of the sands of London at that moment is somebody who wasn't even born in the city. Someone who wasn't born in the city comes here at a very young age, adopts it, and is a, able to get to the top of the musical game. I think that's that's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's an amazing thing, and I think this is a modern. Uh, feminist anthem. Uh, go on to Tim. Do you want to go? No, no, it's not gone. No, no, not at all. I'm, I'm well, okay. I'm it's humbly, just, honestly, now I'm yeah. humbly waiting to be taught about things that I don't know a great deal about. Because Open remember, my mind. But because remember, Rita Ora, and chip in whenever you want, Mark, because you know, you probably know this better than me. Rita Ora is representing, um, well, certainly representing the female perspective on. Uh, infidelity maybe um, but certainly 
relationships that don't work out. We've heard from the fellas. We've heard from you. You know, she broke my heart. She broke my heart. She did this to me. You know, what a boo she is because she did this to me. Now we're hearing from the ladies, and her her response to all of that is, R I P. Yeah, rest in peace. Uh, to the girl you used to see. Her days are over, baby, she's over. I decided to give you all of me. Baby, come closer, baby, come closer. Okay, maybe she didn't need to repeat the baby come closer so many times. But you see, when I say RIP, I don't just mean rest in peace. I mean, rewind it, please, so we can remain in peace. I had to read it properly to get it right in perspective because you reside in poverty but don't want rights in property you'd rather rob innocent people because he gains respect in popping me that the real ignorant philosophy we need to reject its prophecy stand up and r.i.p rep it properly do you get it is, is that a tiny tempo uh, rap? In the no, 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 no. Suli breaks, Suli breaks, mate, Suli breaks. So stand up and R.I.P. Rep it properly, because Ra, its peak, went from rice and peas to rifles in pockets, ruining interstate projects. Ra, it's a par to its riots in park. Raw, I plead. Remember, I plead. The realness I preach. We have reminders in present. Why do you think that Dami Lola Taylor Center, RIP, remains in Peckham? Rise in position. Life, remember its price. If you say Reba, it's principle, but really it's pride. Ra, I preach, remember it, please. If you don't just remember this piece. So next time you hear me say R.I.P. No, I don't just mean rest in peace. I mean, rewind it, please. So we can remain in peace. Ra, do you get it now? Well, it's, it's, it's entering my brain slowly. Yeah. Um, Mark, the point I'm trying to make that is entering Tim's brain slowly is that RIP, just the, that acronym means so many things to so many people. But I think what Rita Ora does is encapsulate all of that in a relationship. So it can mean rewind it, please. That's why I want to shout out to the DJ when I hear that song for the first time. DJ, rewind it, please. R.I.P. Yeah? yeah? And then yeah. it means rise in position. Against the imposition of this love thing that's going on, be yourself. Be the woman you are. R.I.P. It's an anthem for those who choose it to be. That's an original, by the way, the last couplet. I, I, I like to think it's... Um... It's a little bit more romantic than that, actually, and that it's you oh, know, when a relationship well. ends, a little bit of you dies inside. Yeah, yeah. Romance in pieces is what you're trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> R.I.P. Yeah. <laughs> Do you get it now, Tim? Yeah, and you're you're hauling me, screaming and kicking into the yeah, into the 21st yeah, century. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not. That's not the only feminine anthem in the charts at this point. Arguably Young by Talisa. Uh, I'm so pleased to see her there because she is the one. Um, when, when, when I ran an internet TV company called Color Telly, we went and filmed um, her group. Um, when uh, What were they called again, Mark? The and group? Dubs. And yeah, dubs. In, N-dubs, N-dubs. And she was a singer. She had like curly hair. She obviously hadn't had a stylist yet. And she was just like this kind of quirky girl with glasses with curly hair at the time playing in Camden or something like that. And to see her transform was amazing. But more importantly, her, and this is a feminist thing, I think, it wasn't billed like that. Her greatest claim to fame now is that she essentially brought down the hound of Fleet Street, the so-called fake Sheikh who tried to do the dirty on her by 
you know, inviting her to uh, a meeting in a hotel, that was his, um, that was his uh, modus operandi when he was fishing some target that he would expose in the news of the world subsequently. She arguably, arguably brought down the news of the world. This, this young girl, when she took on the might of that paper and their star um, uh, gossip um, expose journalist, um, I, I hesitate to call him a journalist because when you dupe people like that, I don't know where the journalism is. Anyway, he duped her into thinking he was some big uh, Hollywood mogul shake and um, said to her, yeah, yeah, could you get her some cocaine or whatever? Like, and she said, oh, well, you know, whatever she said, I don't know. But it was a setup and she took it to court and won. She won that case. So for the young people that she represents in that song, she says, look, you know, yeah, we're young, but we're just living our lives. That is a tune that has resonance today, I think. What say you, Mark? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Talisa and Endubs, actually. I, and I know they're kind of slightly mocked by kind of mainstream media at the mo at the moment but actually I, I kind of quite enjoyed what they did i like their their backstory about their uncle who i think might have been yes. talisa's dad was it talisa's no dad it was talisa's uncle it was the other guy's gab gab's what's his name gab's or dappy whatever. dappy 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 yeah that's his dad and so when they had the documentary about her journey you know really distressful documentary because you see this young girl being torn apart by this newspaper she goes for a moment of solace to his grave and says look he was our biggest supporter you know it's the only person i can come to at this time when all these newspapers are tearing us are tearing me because they're focused on her apart you're absolutely right to bring that in uh go on and and, they, and again another you know they're a group full of you know the kids of, of immigrants as well right so that that kind of multicultural cosmopolitan nature of London comes through there and and you know I think Dappy and Talisa are both in the kind of Greek background possibly Greek Cypriot yeah. I'm not sure but they're not they're not singing Greek music they're singing London music it's the sound of what's going on in the city that they live in and I'll they're, you they're what, proud of it as well when I, I grew up in what we called Little Cyprus which was the half a mile stretch between Manor House it was probably a mile in total mm, yeah probably a mile in total between between Manor House and Turnpike Lane. That was Little Cyprus on Green Lanes, North London, N4, essentially, N4 to N8. And I can tell you this, um, my best friend was Greek Cypriot, he's late now, and I was brought into his home like a son. You know, we went out, we blacks and Greeks, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, we went out to clubs together. Before the, <clears throat> Uh, the civil war in Turkey, in, sorry, in Cyprus in the early 70s, Greeks and Turks were together. Uh, the day that Turkey invaded Cyprus after there was a kind of a, a coup in Cyprus led by some right wing nutter who was backed by Greece. The day of that invasion by Turkey, every single shop window in that stretch between Manor House and Turnpike Lane that was owned by a Greek person or a Turkish person. They were innocuous little shops that were always known as like Nicosia FC. They always had the names of a, um, a football club in Cyprus to represent them. But they were basically little gambling clubs where the old timers used to sit and play cards and everything. Every single one of those shops had their windows broken. It was a horror, it was a horror. I, I took the bus from uh, one stop down from Manor House, going towards Turnpike Lane to go to school that morning. And it was like the, the closest I'd ever been to a war zone at the time. It was sad to see that community ripped apart. Anyway, when, I, when you talk Greek Cypriot, I see them from growing up when we were under the same kind of duress. Okay, they had it a little bit lighter because you know, get away with being white or whatever. But we were stopped from going into the same clubs. We love the same kind of music. We went to the same kind of, um, places you know we <laughs> we chirps the same kind of girls or you know vice versa if it was girls and boys and we 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 were together we we didn't see any difference you know we genuinely didn't see any difference amongst ourselves um there was a little bit of racism amongst the older generation of greek cypriots but i, I say if my best friend is greek where well, his parents are just gonna have to um, absorb that and take it and they took it very well they took it very well so let's go into what, the number. What, what, what that's made me, made me think of a little bit is differences in the black 
Irish dynamic mm. because yeah. in 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 our country in England there's a kind of outsider status you know no blacks no Irish title of Johnny Rotten's Rotten's autobiography um, mm -hmm. whereas in the United States it develops on a completely different basis isn't it with the Irish taking control of the police well, in some parts of America, you're absolutely right. In New York, Chicago, I think it's the same as that. But it's funny, that that statement that you throw, or that, um, that anecdote that you've thrown out, that statement, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, was a full thing. And that was something that was um, legal at the time, or it wasn't illegal at the time, to put up when you had a vacant room, often it was a room rather than a flat, and you were putting out a sign on your window saying, look, you know, um, room to rent. But they would say no blacks, no Irish and no dogs. And what that that continued um, um, punctuation did was bring blacks or put black people and Irish people on the same level. <laughs> so when I was at university in the 80s, Irish students were then very political because of the troubles in Northern Ireland. They were very, very political. They argued that they should be members of the Black Students Alliance. And they became members of the Black, Black Students Alliance, of my university at least, because we couldn't argue against it when they said, look, we are the N-words of, you know, the, 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 the sort of Irish equivalent of the N-words. We're treated like that, and you couldn't argue against that, mm. could you? The, as, as a young black man at the time, did you feel that was the case as well? Did you feel that they were getting the same kind of treatment that, that you and your, your other fellow black peers were getting as well? Not until they made that claim. Because remember, as I grew up as a young black man, but very much as an Englishman. Yeah. And so at the time when I was growing up, there were still all the stereotypical Irish jokes. And we saw Irish people as other than us I'll, I'll be honest we saw <clears throat> one of the guys i started my first band with at school was an irish guy whose parents were of both sides of the sectarian divide so they had to leave northern ireland he had to drop the o in his name o kane to just kane i always knew him as chris kane or we knew him everybody knew him as paddy that was it. If you were Irish, that was your nickname at school, whatever the situation. He went on, by the way, to become the saxophonist with bad manners. The first person from our school to actually succeed. Opa. Yeah, I was, yeah, Chris I was listening to them yesterday. Yeah, there you go. Fantastic. All the way in Brazil? Yeah, what do they yeah, think of yeah. bad manners in Brazil? No, they've never heard of bad manners, you know. <laughs> I, have to, so, I have to get my head out of Brazil sometimes. So, you see, that was one song that your missus didn't say, oh, uh, I went to the gym and I danced <laughs> no. to <laughs> no, 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 no spinning to to lip up fatty <laughs> very good mate you're on form today and uh, mark we're gonna have to sharpen our claws because the man's ready like a tiger <laughs> but number oh, three yeah go, go on, on, go on. No, you go on no no go on i'll come in later go on well, only because i want to bring together a triumvirate of female anthems and there's a couple more in the charts as well but this triumvirate true. good point uh, of three female anthem so r.i.p rita aura features tiny temper on the rap but then young by uh Talisa, and then finally call me maybe carly ray jepson i'll tell you what like you probably when i first heard this i thought are you having a laugh call me maybe oh how cute can that be oh i get it call me maybe but it's it's the change in the way that a song by a woman whether it was written by a woman or not is now taking control of relationships just like r.i.p you know until until this point i think there were the odd tunes where you know r-e-s-b-e-c-t that's what but it's not like this r-e-s-p-c-t has still got a lot of love for it look it's just like come on give me some respect no, 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 no. This one is saying, oh, yeah, you treat me like that. Oh, well, call me, maybe. And when I first heard it, it took me two or three times. She goes, here's my number. So call me, maybe. I just met you and this is crazy. But here's my number. Call me, maybe. She's not completely, um, it's not without qualification. And um, 
your stars was holding, ripped jeans, skin was showing, hot night, wind was blowing, where you think you're going, baby? And she's in control of this relationship, even though she said all the things that once upon a time women would go, ah, just like that girl from Ipanema. All the people went, ah, he's got ripped jeans, skin was showing, hot night, wind was blowing, ah. But, Mark, am I correct in that interpretation? Because there is another one. She could be pleading, call me, maybe, if you want. No, I, th I think your interpretation is correct. I, qu I, I quite like this song as a pop song. It's the, you know, it's the kind of song if you're listening to Radio 2, if it's enforced upon you somewhere, wherever you may be, and it's, come on, you're not going to complain. But I always think it's, I think Carly Rae Jepsen's Canadian, and it kind of feels very Canadian, very unoffensive, very, yeah, it's not yeah. even like, call me. It's, call me, maybe, if you want. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit of Brian Adams there, isn't it? You know, yeah. um, but... Hmm. Let's forgive her, 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 her national origins. Uh, I think even Canadians can be feminists. Do you know what I mean? Um, but not one certain maybe, English. Well, maybe minute, certainly yeah. Canadians can be feminists. Have you ever seen well, the, like the, 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 Mur the Murdoch Mysteries? You know, a crime series set at the turn of the, the, the 19th to 20th century. The agenda there is very, very interestingly pro feminist looking explicitly at the role of women um, in that time. So uh, maybe, maybe this is something that, that, that Canada likes to talk about. Maybe, maybe. Call me. I've learned, see, I've learned that that's how you spot a Canadian. Of course they you say do. a boot or a boot. doots. Yeah. A boot. That, yeah, yeah. That's how yeah, you do that's, it. That's the way you tell them from uh, Americans. But the way that Americans tell us from Australians, I just don't know. I think yeah. they think we're all Australians. You know, we all yeah. sound the same in any that's case. That's what I got when the only time I was in the States. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where in Australia are you from? <laughs> <laughs> Cock? <laughs> Can so I just say, for the record, I do love Canada, and it's, I think it's a great place. Like, can I just say for, against it. It's great. Can I just say, for the record, I really hate Canada. Um, I went, I travelled, I left um, Harlem at about five o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning. Harlem was jumping. I mean, proper, proper jumping. It was like five o'clock in the morning. So what? We ain't going to stop till uh, midday or whatever it is. You could hail a gypsy cab down a moment. They're all driving up and down. the cab. People were jumping on the streets five o'clock in the morning. Went to LaGuardia Airport, took the flight, uh, about an hour flight, maybe a 45 minute flight to Toronto where a beautiful girl was waiting for me, man. She was waiting and she, oh, she was waiting for me. There's always one in one of your stories. <laughs> well, well, yeah. well I, this isn't mm -hmm. going to end as sweetly as they normally do. Or <laughs> well, maybe it's the other way around. But I arrived and I thought, because I lived in Stockholm, I thought this is like Stockholm. Everything was so clean, whereas Harlem was dirty and noisy. In Toronto, it was silent. So it would have been about nine o'clock in the morning in Toronto on a Saturday morning, it was like, dead at the airport and she she met me there oh right great don you're gonna love this you're gonna love this and I'm, like, I'm not sure babe i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm gonna love this and she said and she was determined to convince me in two days i should move to toronto and you know well uh, let, let me stop there for the moment if i need to get back to what happened next i will do during the conversation but you know some things should stay between um under the, beneath the sheets if you know what i mean so um should we talk football yeah, well, first, a little point I want to make on, on uh, you've, you've done very well with convincing me of the value of, of the music of, of, of this era from a lyrical point of view. Mm. From a musical point of view, I, I, no, listen to, and I could just, like the man, the one in control, and it probably is almost certainly a man in the vast, vast majority of cases. Are you sure cases, about that? Is, have, have you yeah, met Rihanna? Well, hang on. Is the techno nerd who's pushing the buttons. Mm. They're vehicles for producers, you know, rather than organic bands, rather than organic. It, it, I, I just feel this kind of maths graduate or something like that, this techno nerd pushing the buttons. And that, that for me, that, that, that's the thing that disenchants me with, with so much modern music. Mark, the, the, the focus of creativity moved from the kind of creative people to the techno nerds. I think I think Tim's a little bit misunderstood here because I think the the point is is that now with the way music's gone, is any kid with a laptop and or even a That's smartphone true, true, can true. can make music. You don't need to have scraped together money to buy a keyboard or a guitar or have access to 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 some instruments or a studio. There's kids who are making incredible music in their bedrooms off of very relatively cheap piece of technology. So actually, the, the proliferation of music is is greater, which can only be a good thing, right? 
No, true, true, true. And I am ludicrously behind the times on this, and I need to. Need, I need, but I still think that something has been lost. Something in the the organic making of music of people making it together, rather than one techno nerd kind of pressing pressing buttons. Mate, um, I can't agree with you because if you look from the beginning of uh, the music industry's um development i would say that there have always been a techno nerd there oh, cool. yeah, cool. sure the, and technology yeah. technology and the development of technology is a key part of the development of the music yeah you know phil Spector now disgraced obviously but phil Spector was a techno nerd um george martin with the beatles he was the techno nerd yeah you, you need someone who can do it but the creativity and as, as George Martin would say, it was coming from them. The ideas were coming from them. And I'm not, I'm not sure that's, that's the case. Uh, I, I, I beg to differ. Like I said, Mark, he obviously doesn't know much about Rihanna, who's number eight in the charts with Where Have You Been? Could you imagine any man calling the shots over Rihanna? Because that's what, what's his name trying to do? You know, the bloke that he was, she was together with for ages. Chris Brown, yeah. Yeah, Chris Brown, you know. She didn't take any nonsense there. And I can't imagine her not, she's a business like Madonna. She is, in fact, she is the, the Bajan, the, the Madonna from Barbados. And I can't, can you imagine that, Mark? No, she's, she's, she was at one point a soldier as well, right? She was signed up for the, oh, well, to, to the army. So she comes about, she does her business like, 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 a, like a soldier walks through, knows what she wants, executes her orders, and then moves on to the next level, right? I didn't even know that. So there you go. Pam, 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 as we say, not in an aggressive <laughs> way, of course. That's just a way of dance hall thing to say. Take it, take both shots, take double barrel, as Ansel Collins and uh, Dave and Ansel Collins would say. Ah, and the magnificent, the W O O O, Mr. Vickery. Yeah, um, but all right, to, to, to seg this into, into the football, uh, I asked the question Does any of this stuff move? you or does it move anyone on the same emotional level as people were moved by the events of may the 13th 2012 when man city beat queens park rangers to win the premier league everybody was moved by that mark um, even the likes of you who didn't support either club it seemed like everybody had skin in this game who did you want to win that match remember this is a crunch final match of the season qpr are playing for their Premier League survival. If they don't win this, they're going down. They had to win it, didn't they, Mark? Uh, I, yeah, well, they either had to win it or the results elsewhere had to go their way. So the only way they were in control is if they won it, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, for them, it's kind of a crunch game. I, 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 I've declared my interest before in this podcast. I'm definitely a Liverpool fan. So I, I was quite keen for Man City to, to usurp the... the the other team in that city to 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 try and get the title and what you'd rather that Man City won the title than because they needed to win that no they they could draw it I think and if results elsewhere went their way they could still lift the title trophy if I'm correct either that or they had to win it so you're saying you would rather you a West Londoner Ah, that might be it, Tim. You see, I yeah. forgot. He's in Brentford's yeah. his other team, isn't it? Indeed, yeah. He so I, he, I think he's entitled to say QPR, QPR, QPR. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that was good. I've sung it many so times. Harsh. <laughs> the R's, the R's, yeah. The R's have it. The R's have it. The R's have it. I have actually also stood at Loftus Road a number of times and I love joining in with the uh, come on, you super hooper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw, I saw the reggae boys when they came over to play mm. in the uh, World Cup 1998 in France. They did their pre match thing there at Loftus Road. And I went with my missus, she was about eight months pregnant at the time. And uh, big belly, big belly. And I think the little one was jumping around inside. Uh, as well. But it wasn't a good day for, for um, 
Jamaica, the reggae boys. We came out in force, you know. I've never seen so many black women at a football match. You wouldn't believe it. It was like, hang on, you know, this is like Mr. Super Cool Jamaica tournament, you know. And they saw the cute little boy, ah, oh, cute little boy. Then afterwards, they started getting into, at first, they were like looking at how, how tasty all these like really well-toned Jamaican men were and thinking, why can't we have black men like that over here, man? <laughs> Then halfway through, they suddenly realized, no, no, they're supposed to push the ball forward, not from side to side <laughs> and backwards, which was the first <laughs> half. And he said, like, no, man, if you fling it that way, that way, no, not that, that way. <laughs> Honestly, I swear to you, that was what it was like. It was like carnival. I literally saw, uh, you know, maybe 10 or well, 5,000 black women suddenly get as passionate about that game as uh, QPR fans and uh, Man City fans were about this final. Oh, and let's not forget the Liverpool fans as well were about this uh, final match of the season as well. Um, so where are you sitting in the stadium, Mark? Are you, are you in there? Are you there or are you at home watching this? I was, I was at home watching this. Um, I was, I think I was probably hung over on the sofa and I remember the Man United game coming to an end and then beating Sunderland. And I can't remember who the commentators were, but they were they were in the process of doing the, you know, United won the title at this. This was the key turning point of the moment. You know, uh, Man City will have to reload and, you know, will, will Mancini stay on as manager? Will, will, the, uh, will the owners put, put more, even more money into the club? Uh, Ferguson's done it again and, and all that stuff. And then suddenly all eyes on um, on the Etihad, right? And it all Indeed. turns on the sixpence. Did you, did you see that stuff I sent you, the commentary from the uh, Sky the Sky Sports lot when they're watching this game? Did you see it? Did any of you see that? Because I think in that commentary, those Sky, you know the Sky Sports team that sit and watch the game and comment on it when Sky doesn't have the rights to the football or, you know, within the footballing hours of three to five o'clock they're not allowed to show live matches so you've got a team of former footballers like Sir Paul Merson and all that watching the game on behalf and the great Jeff Stelling hosting it and they know that this because all the other matches they're watching all the Man United stuff as well at the same time but all the other matches seem to sort of pale into insignificance because of the intensity of this one match on this day with literally all to play for, for both sides. And Tim, you were saying a moment ago about the passion. You can actually, I don't know if I've seen any match where the camera just keeps panning to yeah. so the to spectators. The yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's yeah. emotional. <laughs> well, City TV, Man City's TV channel, they did a follow-up documentary identifying those fans and then going and interviewing them afterwards. And it, That's it's, brilliant. That it, it, brilliant. It's, 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 brilliant. It's great. Yeah. Like my favourite is the fella who the week before when they won the game the week before, so they've got it. They've they, you know it's an all they've got to do is beat QPR. <laughs> 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 I mean, so uh, he goes and has a big tattoo with Premier League champion. <laughs> <laughs> and then the moment the game kicks off, he starts getting nervous because you know before the game you're already yeah you're three points we've done it, and then as soon as the game kicks off you realise that there's a contest you know and it. The ball is round and it could go either way. So he's spending the whole game thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to need a hacksaw to cut my arm off or something. You know, it's like uh, someone I know here, who, uh, a woman who uh, she had a, a huge tattoo of her boyfriend's name. You know? Uh, my brother's done that. Uh, my brother's did. done that. No. Of his girlfriend's name, I hate since I before he <laughs> whacks me in the back of the head. But <laughs> usually when you put in a tattoo like that, you know, the relationship doesn't un, 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 totally come apart in a course of 95 minutes. But in the case of this tattoo, you know, he, he was, it was all over. Uh, I love watching this because we're really seeing it from the point of, a, of, the point of view of a fan. And you're not a diehard half fan who goes every week. And me, from the professional thing, I'm, I'm distanced from that kind of emotion. So it, you, you're looking at these people and, and how much emotion they've got invested in, 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 in this thing. There's a woman who, and lots of them didn't see the end. You know, lots of the City fans and didn't see the end. They couldn't take it. You they can't take, take it. it. Or they've already walked out and, and uh, you know, imagine. You're going to lie after that, aren't you? You're not going to tell anyone. No, exactly. You you. You know, yeah, I was there. I, know. I always believed. You know. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you caught on camera in that way. Mark made a point, and it just about the 
that the managers a moment ago. This is part of the drama because it's QPR. Remember, May the 13th, 2012. Well, who's, the, who's, the, who's the QPR manager? Exactly. Yes. And the QPR manager is a former Manchester United star, and that might have influenced Mark's decision as well for uh, for Man City to rub it, it to rub their noses in it. I don't know. You feel free to comment on that. Former Manchester United star, and also former manager of Man City, and the yeah, bloke. He's, he's the one they've got rid of. Got rid you know, of because they don't think he's going to get them to the Premier League uh, Premier League title. And they got rid of him, you might remember, um, you, you might not, Tim, because you were in Brazil, but Mark, you might remember they got rid of him in the most despicable way. They basically, on the match where everything hangs, the decision's almost been made for him when he was Man City manager, because suddenly, guess who the camera is focusing on amongst the spectators? One, Roberto Mancini, who everybody... But Mark Hughes, maybe, although he must know, he must know. They brought Mancini in not to watch the flipping match. They brought him in to replace me. He must know at that point. I thought that that was um, a really unclassy, tasteless and somewhat despicable way to let this person go. Mark, do you you remember that? Yeah, I I do remember that. And I do remember feeling that must be such a that's just such a horrible feeling isn't it there's there's only two industries where where the, well maybe three industries where something like that happens football management and then radio and tv presenting you know where like quite quite frequently and i'm sure you've seen this in the past as well Dustin, where you'll you'll be at a radio station and th- maybe this is a bit inside baseball but you see uh another presenter walk through and everyone's mm-hmm. suddenly like oh, oh, oh what's going on here what, why is the program director suddenly? And it's and it's it. The, the, I, I, I'm not really a presenter, so I've never had had that. I've, feeling, I've been in that. I've been in that very position, and I've been the other person that walked in. Oh wow! You know, and I I, I was the other person brought in by a very senior member of the management who decided, look, you know, time for a change of guard. The person who'd been <clears throat> sitting there, another black person. And this was in the days when there weren't very many black presenters at the BBC. So he knew what was going on. Well, she brought me in to do a, a, you know, what we would call a pilot, not expecting him to be there, actually. So I was sitting down doing this pilot in the basement of this BBC studio. And he walked in with some woman, you know, because you know, if only black guy at the BBC or one of the few black guys in the BBC, you're going to style it out. You know, you're going to go and chirp some woman and say, yeah, 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 I'm a big shot at the BBC. I'll take you around the building. You know, I've got my pass, take you around the building. And that was one of those things because he shouldn't have been there on a Saturday night. And he walks in, sees me there. And he doesn't know who I am. And then sees this director. And it's kind of like a very uncomfortable thing for all of us. Because I know that he knows, that she knows, that he knows. And he knows that what's going on, if you see what I mean. It's very uncomfortable. It's very, very uncomfortable. I'm not going to say who the guy was because he's not here. Um, He's passed now. But imagine this. This guy was very generous to my missus. Very, very generous in his life as a radio presenter to my missus, as a musician. So I, I, I didn't want it to be like that, but, and I didn't sort of take over from him, by the way, because basically they axed that program period, but I still feel a little bit queasy about that. It's funny. It's funny. I mean, what life throws at you? Anyway, that, 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 that was, uh, by the by, Roberto Mancini, when he was sitting there, he must have felt uncomfortable as well because the camera kept panning on him and then panning on on um, Mark Hughes and watching the reaction to them, of them, to what was going on on the pitch. Uh, and and th- th- that was like a year before, was it? Was it a year or two before when uh, Mark Hughes got dissed by, I think it might have been just two years, it might have been two years before 2010 or something that Mancini came in. Or it might have been that previous year. I think the 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 thing about being in Mancini's position there is it's kind of like you know if you if you live by the sword you'll die by the sword right and you know that if that's if if the management of the club are willing to do that to the current manager they'll be willing to do it to you when the time is 
time is right. And that's almost what happened to him is again, right? And with all the speculation in the papers and all that about his time being up as well, when his when his time was was due, I suppose, to move on. You know the rules of the game when you when you get in the ring, don't you? All's fair in love and war and, and Premier League management. But surely you you believe as a manager that's never going to happen to me. You must believe it. No, no. You, you, you really? No, I, th- I think you develop you develop some thick skin along the way. You know, it's it's a little bit like the old country song. You know, why have you left the one you left me for? Your day's <laughs> going to come. Yeah, yeah. What's that do then for a manager, Tim? You you've been close up and personal with these people. What's that do? Can they ever be secure? Ever secure in their job? Can they ever feel secure? Surely they must need some security to be able to take. A, a, a club to its limit, not least because they need a certain amount of respect from the players. You know, if the players think, well, you, I'm not doing what you say because you're here today, gone tomorrow. They can't, you know, the manager can't operate under that, those circumstances, can it? Anyway, look, at, uh, look at Jose Mourinho. A few years ago, he was a film star. Look at him now. Look how much he's, he's aged. Uh, look at the, the this, I've got a book about Guardiola at Barcelona. And the aging process during those few years he was at Barcelona was incredible. I've got a book with uh, Cesar Luis Minotti, who's in charge of Argentina, between 74 and in 78 when they, won, when they won the World Cup. And it's a point that he makes in a book about winning the 78 World Cup. He puts a photo of himself at 74 and a photo of himself at 78. And he's aged 20 years. I mean, smoking 300 cigarettes a day probably didn't help. However, you know, it, it's, you, know you just look at him and you think, that's, it's, Mourinho for me is the example. Because he was a film star a few years ago, and he he, he looks like an old man now, you know. That's Quite, the price. But yeah, I know what you mean. I know yeah, what you mean. He, well, he's aged a lot, and he's still mm. looking looking reasonably good for his age. Mm. But he's not going to be given the the lead in a in a in a Indiana Jones film anymore. And he might have been a few years ago. And Whereas that, you, 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 you you would still get that lead, wouldn't you? You with your film star messy <sighs> idol looks. I don't think I think I've just just crossed the uh, just cro- you know I'm, only I was waiting, just, I, I only was just. Wait, I, well I was waiting for offers you know and the right script didn't come <laughs> and, you know so you know, uh, yeah that's my excuse as well so get to the back of the queue on that one but this game should we talk through this game it's, can I just can I just add something about the manager's stuff because I think there's a there's a strange paradox in it as well right where I I feel to really get to the top of ma- of the management tree you need to have or as a club you. Need to have another club there to push you on. So at the moment, you see that in the Premier League with Man City and Liverpool. You've seen it over the years with Real Madrid and Barcelona. You saw it with uh, with Arsenal and Man United when Fergie and uh, uh, Wenger were in their were in their pomp. The paradox is, is for especially for like the super clubs that you've got in Europe now, is that if you you could be playing incredibly good football and amazing football, but if you manage to you know finish second with like ninety six points then the ownership might just go, now nah, he's the wrong guy. But you've basically taken the team. You've got mm-hmm. the team playing at such an amazing level. So there, there is absolutely no job security in, the, in it at all. And Chelsea that's why started I think it that ages. nonsense, didn't it? Chelsea started that nonsense. I mean, Man City followed them, but Chelsea started that nonsense, just getting rid of... Um, uh, who, who was it that won them the Champions League? Roberto, what's his name, that used to play for them brilliantly? Di Matteo. Yeah, Di Matteo. I mean, wins the Champions League, the trophy that they've always wanted. And it's like, <laughs> goodbye to Jane, you know. Um, the, the match, though, there's this you, moment... You're, you're, on a, you're, on a, you're on a Slade role, aren't you, at the moment? You, you've, oh, uh... no. they, 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 they had a little bit of rock with their role as well, so why not? But the, the, at the beginning of the game, I think the game for me starts in that tunnel. Is they're lining up in the tunnel. There is this air of expectation anxiety and anticipation and whatnot, tense atmosphere, but the, the, the place is buzzing. It's buzzing, not jumping. They start doing the jumping backwards, you know, that they learned off the Eastern Europeans when they score a goal. But the place ain't like that at the beginning. It's nail-bitingly tense, but buzzing. It's, it, there's a buzz there. And the players have already been prepared for that buzz when they come into the tunnel and they're lining up in the tunnel and there's a shot there of Anton Ferdinand looking somewhat furtively at his counterpart, uh, I mean the um, professional counterpart of Man City, the person that he's got to defend, I think it might be Dzeko. And Anton is trying to style it out like you would expect, you know, a black Londoner to do. Style it out, yeah, you think you're so flash kind of thing. But look in his eyes, he's like, Shit, I didn't realise you were that big. 
fuck me. I'm sorry to swear, Anton, you probably never sworn in your life. Yeah. Although I've seen that you doing that um, Superfly or Superman thing with, uh, what's his name, Nigel Rio Coca in your flat. <clears throat> I don't think you're going to live that one down there. It was good. It was good. You know, you're doing the old soldier boy uh, Superman thing. And I thought he danced to the left, danced to the right really well. And Nigel Rio Coca's career, of course, went downhill after that video was shot and shown. But nevertheless, um, you know, you look at him and think, that's what they're up against. They're up against thoroughbreds. I've seen that with Man United. When Man United played that FA Cup final against, um, was it Millwall? And the Millwall guys, because, you know, day of FA Cups, uh, for those who don't know, the cameras are there at Wembley early on. So they're, they're showing the players come off their coaches. And, you know, you see the Millwall players come off the coach and they look like, you know, proper, proper up for the game, proper up for the game athletes. But then you see Cristiano Ronaldo and the Man United lot slope off their bus and they're like, you know, their headphones on and everything. And they're like thoroughbreds. And suddenly the Millwall fans old Millwall players look like donkeys in comparison. I'm not, I'm not taking the mickey. But when I saw that, I thought, that is the difference. It's a little bit like that here. So they're going to need to kill a couple of big giants to win this one. And they, what they need to stay in the Premier League, you know? Well, for me, the game starts when QPR equalise. Because up until that point, you know, City, they've got 90 minutes to win the game. And it's just a case of can they break quick, quick uh, QPR down and pressure, pressure, pressure. Goal comes, 1-0 halftime. Everything's following the script. Zappaletta. Zappaletta, <laughs> yes. Uh, and everything's following the script. And then one defensive mistake. And it's interesting to see who didn't stay long at, at, at City. You know, Lescott didn't stay long. He makes the mistake. Mm -hmm. so he, he's one of right. Let's wean him out. Actually, and Joe Hart didn't stay that long either, the goalkeeper, mm -hmm. who uh, I, I think probably could have done better on the second goal. But anyway, so suddenly, out of the blue, QPR equalised. And at that point, I think the game really starts. Because at that point, all of the nerves kick in. Because, you know, from the start, you, you're saying, yeah, all right, we've got 90 minutes to do this. Everything's going well. Everything's going well. And then suddenly, it might not happen. There are other, other alter, alternative endings are available. And they, they become possible at the moment when QPR equalised. And after that, it, 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 it's just insanity. It, the, the red card for, for, for Joey Barton, the elbow, was it an elbow? Was it a really red card <laughs> offence? Would it have happened if it wasn't Joey Barton? Would if, it was VAR, if it was VAR, it would have happened. It would have gone off the pitch. If it was VAR, just because of the movement. Sometimes it's not just that you actually hit somebody, but the movement shows an intent. And I'm sorry, if you got your elbow coming towards my face. I'm not going to concentrate on trying to score that goal. I think Carlos Tevez does do the old, you know, what we accuse Argentinians of, and I'm sorry, it's unfair, but nevertheless, they do go down a little bit easier than us. Most English players, with, I'm not going down for that, you know, for the whole... Well, I don't know why he's, he's protecting his face. It's not a very nice face to start with. <laughs> no, that's uncalled for, mate. That is, that is that's cruel. Yeah, that's no, cruel. That Apologies. Is, no, I, I think he's, 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 um, he's no beauties in the eye of the behold. <laughs> Older. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure his mum thinks you're out, bang out of order for that one. But no, on a serious note, though, it's kind of like most English players would have just thought, first of all, it's Joey Barton. I'm not going to give Joey Barton the pleasure of people talking about his elbow in my face for the next 10 years of my life. You know, whereas Argentinians have got no, no skin in that game. They think, yeah, I'm going yeah. down. Everybody in Argentina is going to say, yes, well done. Well done. That was good. Talk about not giving Tim Vickery a, a leading part in one of our movies. We'll give you one instead, though. You know, at that point, I don't agree, Mark, though. I think, it seems, Tim says, and I think he's, he's, he's got a point. I, I think that equaliser is the beginning of the denouement of the game. But That's a good if word. you see, I know, I just thought I'd throw it in. Um, I don't even know what it means. But <laughs> the, 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 the point I'm making, though, is... I think it started in the tunnel and certainly for the first 20, 30 minutes of that game, 35 minutes maybe before, before Zappaletta's goal, City are just banging it in from all angles. And I mean, to see Yaya Toure just take a wild kick and go miles off, to see David Silva just take a wild kick and go miles off, to see Naz, uh, Sammy Nasri take, well, I mean, he's not as, you know, as iconic maybe, but nevertheless, he took about 10 wild kicks 
and you're thinking to them, they are desperate. They're playing like a championship club where nothing to lose means just bang it. Or did you do your Clough accent again, by the way, Tim? Just bang it from, just bang it from, oh, I can't do it. Bang it from any, any position. You, goalie, try and score, whatever. Just bang it in. You know, there's no finesse about it. Only that. takes a second to score a goal. That's better. <laughs> I, I, I think the whole, the whole game is a psychological play, isn't it? It's, mm. it's yeah. kind of, it, you look, man for man, there's no, there's no QPR players getting anywhere near that Man City side, mm. right? And it's, you're sitting there in the in the in the change room before the game if you're a Man City player and you're like, well, this is on us, isn't it? This is pure. You've worked so hard to get to this point in your career. You've worked hard all season to get to the point where you're still in it on the last day to go. Do I have it in us to go to go win the game by two goals? Do we have it in us to go put put them to bed? And then suddenly they get on the pitch and then the 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 kind of the jitters kick in, don't they? The um, and for for the first, well, for the vast majority of the game, it looks like they can't quite hold on. But then, you know, for, I, I don't know how it happens. I don't know what 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 switches on. But then there's that moment, and then suddenly it all kind of there's that little bit of magic, and that's why we love the game so much, isn't it? I actually don't think that Aguero gets enough credit for his goal because everyone thinks about the shot, but he has created the space. For the shot, does. that's his yeah. style, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and remember, he's, he's a centre forward. There are like maximum of like 90 seconds left. Where would you expect him to be? Right up there, but there's no space there because that's where all the QPR defenders are. So if he goes there, he's effectively marking himself. Mm. So what does he do? Because he, he, he starts the move, he, he comes out so he can pick up the ball, draw some of the defenders, and then create space to go into from which to shoot. So it's not just the finishing. It's the way that his movement has created the space. And then the balance on the, the it, 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 it does look like a, a right-footed version of Maradona, the way that he has the balance to shoot on the turn. It's a fantastic moment of football, quite apart from what it, what it represents. But even in, a, even in the context of a pre-season friendly, it's a great piece of football. But, 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 you know, to produce that at the moment when you really, really need it, mm-hmm. magical. Tim, can I, can I just ask, do you think that Aguero doesn't quite get the, the kudos he deserves because, A, he plays for, you know, obviously Man City are a massive club, but then, then the, probably the least fashionable of the big clubs in England. And also he just was Argentinian at the wrong moment in history. Yeah, it may be. And one of his problems, I think, has been that... Uh, he hasn't really come off in major international tournaments. Mm. I, I think he's suffered from... He's one of Argentina. I think only two people have scored more goals from, from Argentina, only Messi and Batistuta. So you couldn't call his international career a failure. But it so much is judged on those tournaments, which are at the end of the season. And so often there, he's running on empty. Um, you know, and City really, really had to work hard at him to get him to work harder. Uh, and when he first came over to, to Europe, to uh, Atletico Madrid, they really had to work hard on him to get him off an Argentine diet of mm. fizzy drinks yeah. and beef. Yeah, because you know. I've, I've seen that picture of him when he's still an up-and-coming kid, a football kid, but he's like 11, 12 years old, and he's like about the same size as he is yeah. now. He's really yeah. sort of like chubby kid. And I'm like, why is everybody looking at him in that state and thinking this is the future of football, you know? And he looks brilliant. It, don't get me wrong, he looks healthy, but he clearly is on a different diet. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, uh, but there, there have been times when he hasn't lasted the season. So come the end of the season with the international tournament, he, he, hasn't, he hasn't done himself justice. Um, but I, no, I agree with you. I think, he's, uh, I, th- I think he's underrated. It's one of the things that gets me in, in, in endless trouble on, on Brazilian TV, is saying that I would, I would pick Aguero over Romario. Uh, and that's, <laughs> just, that's just seen as, 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 as absolute heresy. And I won't, I won't deny that Romario was more talented but Aguero, I think, has done much more with it. And he, he just work, works harder for the team. I, I Romario, think... in order to pick him, you've got to put up with him. And you can't put up with him on the, because his entire career is all about... I think there are, there are Freudian reasons for this that we won't get into now. Um, but his, his entire career is, is about earn, winning privileges inside the group. Yeah. I want privileges that you haven't got. Mm. I, want to, I want to be able to go out. You can't go out, but I can go out. And that makes him hell to live with. You know, so... When he, he made his name in the 1994 World Cup. You know, he played one season at Barcelona and then, uh, then he wanted to go home, you know. World Cup, but you just knuckle down with a World Cup for a few weeks and you're legendary. You never have to buy a drink again. Mm. Whereas Aguero, you know, he's, he's won so many things with City. 
Um, but he's also won the Olympics. He's won the under 20 World Cup. And he's year after year after year after year. So uh, if, if, if I'm picking my 11, I would still have Aguero over, over Romario, even though Romario is more talented. Because it do ain't not, just talent. Do you not think that Aguero, like I said, from what I see of Aguero's play, his uh, best trick, if you like, is finding space. Hmm. He spends time finding space, not least because the defenders are twice as tall as him. Yeah. And he has, to, he has to make space for himself that doesn't allow their long legs uh, to get to the ball before he does. And I'm not, I'm surprised that, well, QPR would have done their homework. And I think in internationals, he can be very easily shut down because they're looking for him to try and make that space. And once he, he, he looks frustrated in internationals because he's not getting away with what he would normally get away with in, say, Premier League football or otherwise, which is being able to run loose. You know, when you play a game of football, the most irritating person to play against is, you know, the, the, the little termite that's always biting at your legs, you know, <laughs> and running away. And you're like, where is he now? And he's turning around. And you think he's going then, he's going there. And it's just hard work for somebody who's... I, I suspect so, that you may have thrown one or two Joey Barton-style elbows at this, this time. No, of play. not an elbow. It's usually the shins that we went for <laughs> just to slow them down a bit so they can't go around making space. Who do you think, though? And I think this is the key question in this match where you've got, Two teams both fighting for a kind of survival. Man City have been the second team in Manchester for most of uh, their existence. And here they are with their, you know, like Eminem would say, you got one shot. This is their one shot to say, well, we are now the champions. Or as Mark would have it, that the tables have turned, that there's been a shift. We've passed the baton on, not just to a younger generation, represented by Mark Machado here, but also that the footballing baton has been passed on from what they call Salford or Old Trafford, because there's only one team in Manchester. No, no, they, call it, they call it Salford. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yesterday, today, the day we were recording this, is uh, my 26 years in Brazil. Oh, this, wow. This very, yeah, this very Congratulations. Day. And, and yesterday, I was out having a little coffee. We don't do this very often because it's not, but you know, it's open air, out having a, a little coffee with, uh, with, with, with the wife. And the, there's, the next table, there's two tables out, outdoors. And the next table, there's a, there's a young girl and, and she's talking on her phone. And like, she's English. <laughs> this, this, this is very strange. It doesn't happen very often. And, you know, so I'm talking to her and I, uh, I think to myself, I oh, know that accent. That's Manchester. That's Manchester, that is. That's Pomona. Oh, wait. Is. Don't take the mickey. I lived in Salford, mate. But Pomona's not quite Salford. It is Media City nowadays. Yeah, but Pomona, it's a stop on the, the interactive museum that they call their, their tram system. Uh, and it's no one ever gets on. No. No one ever gets off. It is only there to show the off United. the flat Mancunian accent. Come on. Uh, <laughs> it's the only reason that stop exists. <laughs> Beansgate, Castlefield. I always feel I'm on bandit the, country the, when I go up the, to, the, to Media City. The um, woman that does that voiceover sounded like a woman that used to read news for us. I, I was convinced it was. And I said to her, no, you, you, it's you, isn't it? So everybody says that, but no, it's not me. <laughs> so I said, I, I said to this young I said, uh, is that a Manchester accent? And she said, yeah, it is. You know, people like sometimes I think I'm from Liverpool, but it's not. It's a Manchester accent. 26 years away. You don't lose it, you know. You don't lose it. You don't lose it at all. Uh, you, you've still got it in you. But which, which of those teams has the more pressure? The team, and, and it, you know, there's, there's a history to this, a football history, because, of course, um, if you think about it, 2007-2008 season ended on the last day. 2009-2010 season ended on the last day. You know, Manchester United survived a couple of scares in 2008 at Wigan, and that sent Wigan down, if you remember. But they won 2-0. Uh, I just wonder w w whether it's the team that has to win, the, or that wants to win the title, that has more pressure on them, or it's the team that is fighting for their Premier League survival. In this case, Man City versus QPR, who would you say had the more pressure? In this case, I would say City. 
because you know QPR have fluctuated, haven't they? So you know, but City they haven't done this, and part of the desperation of the fans that you see so is is that right? Uh, we it's it's never going to happen, is it? We're going we're we're going to find another day to we we're, we're going to find another way to 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 to, to, to cock this one up. Uh, well, you're going to take all the complaints, aren't you, from the people from Manchester? <laughs> yeah, I'm not yeah, taking I'll them. You them take them, right. please. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 an existential despair that they're falling into. If this was unite, if this was United in the same <laughs> position, it wouldn't mean as much because they'd won it so many times. But as uh, it's Martin Tyler, isn't it, doing the commentary? Is yeah, Tyler yeah. guilty? Is Tyler guilty? White judges said so. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> See, it's the old songs that I like. It's the only thing I understand. <laughs> the, only la- the only language I understand. Um, really but I, think, I, think, I think Tyler says, you know, it, it's like the start of a new era. And it is, isn't it? It's the start of an era which has seen Man City where, 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 they, where they are now. Had they lost? Had it not happened? You know, and then it just seems like a reinforcing of, of, the, of the natural order of things and a hierarchy where United are, are ahead of City. So I think the pressure is all on City, you know, because maybe, you know, maybe this chance won't come again. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you agree with that, Mark? I, 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 yeah, I agree that there's more pressure on City in this situation. I think the dynamic with Manchester United is quite interesting because I think what happens the next season is Man United come back and win it and then Ferguson retires, doesn't he, at the end of the season. And I, I wonder if, if they'd won it the year before, does he go a year earlier? Is that thought in his mind? Um, if they, if if he if he does win it and then they win it again the next season, does does he go? Maybe my team has got a little bit more left in it, in the tank. Maybe I'll do another more season, uh, one more season. Then what does that mean for who takes over at Man United? Who's left? And so actually, I think um, Manchester City becoming a successful club with all the money they spent was inevitable. And actually, this game has a much bigger impact on what happens to, to Manchester United. Point, point. And, and because there, there's, you know, the, the, the thing that we're basically talking about when we talk about why it's a big deal for City is how the, the psychological impact it, had, it would have had on the City fans for not winning. But actually, what is the psychological impact it has on winning for Manchester United? Because suddenly, the noisy neighbours are, are, are your equals in every, in every way. I mean, and and if if there is a measure in which they're not, they they're going to very quickly catch up. And and talking of noisy neighbours and great Alex Ferguson quotes, the Sky Sports team, um, Jeff Stelling, rightly says it's squeaky bum time. But uh, uh, of the managers, whose bum is squeaking the most? Is it Mark Hughes? Is it Roberto Mancini or is it Alex Ferguson's bum that is squeaking? Yeah. Isn't it ironic? You know, Fergie time, this time working against them. You know, they, they win the Champions League in 99 in the same way that they lose the, the Premier League in, in 2012. I would imagine it's probably Ferguson at the end. Really? Because he can't do, any, he, he can't do anything about it, can he? And he is just there because the game has, has finished just a few minutes earlier. He can't do anything about it. At least Mancini can stand at the side of the and 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 yell and roar and get it out some mm-hmm. get it get it out of his system somehow, as as can as can Mark Hughes. But Ferguson, what can he do but wait? And how does the devil torture souls in hell? He you tell me. He makes them wait. Oh, I, I thought the devil first. Those whom the gods wish to destroy, the devil first makes mad amongst themselves. I thought yeah, that was and then he funny. makes them listen to Queen, but then he makes them wait. Mm. You see, you're showing the difference in class between the school I went to and the school that you went to, which <laughs> was an ex-secondary <laughs> modern school. <laughs> ah, you see, even though I didn't read any of the classics, I was, you know, completely quoted the classics by the teachers <laughs> and didn't know what they were talking about. Do you know, let's quickly look, I mean, it's a great summation of this match and, you know, it's for, for everybody else to see what it means to all those teams. But front pages of papers, which one of these front pages expresses, I don't know, um, the captures the mood, and I'm talking about the mood, including the match the most. 
Hollow, you know, if you've got anything to say about these stories, you might not remember these ones. Front page of the Daily Express, go to Britain for benefits, says EU. So banging that old drum. Is that, is that from today's paper or? No. <laughs> <laughs> the Daily Express, no word of a lie, up to about five years after Princess Diana died, every single one of their front pages was Princess Diana on the front page. I mean, I've been a journalist on my life and I have been told by editors, go out and find a story about Bob Marley, uh, you know, 10 years after he's died so that we can put it on the front page to say there's a new news story about Bob Marley. But I can keep that going for years and years and years. It's beyond me. Uh, front page of the Daily Mail, NHS spends £1 million a week on repeat abortions. Don't remember that story at all. Uh, crazy front page of the Daily Mirror featuring Roberto Mancini uh, talking about the crazy season that uh, this is on the day by the way so this <clears throat> would have been May the 13th 2012 on the day of uh, yeah on the day of the final match of the season that we've been talking about Daily Star's My Secret Gay Lover uh, The Eye which just shows how times have changed that wouldn't be a news story anymore you know unless it was my secret gay lover that my wife didn't know anything about. Do you know what I mean? And then people say, okay, well, that's, you know. My I mean, secret gay asylum seeker lover. No, that would have been the Daily Express, <laughs> which is also owned by the Daily Star or vice versa, actually. Yeah, yeah, not bad link there. Uh, in the eye, it's cuts forcing patients out of hospital early. Uh, Brooks, me and my PMs. This is Rebecca Brooks, former... Uh, well, she was former editor of The News Sun of the and News of the World. Yeah, yeah. News of the World. But at this point, she's the executive director of, um, you know, the uh, Murdoch's uh, newspaper holdings in the UK. And she is the fall guy et uh, of the scandal that brought the News of the World to, um, to its feet and, um, and made Murdoch decide to scrap the paper. Sunderland Echo, I don't know what this is all about, but it's rats a lot. So got, got a picture of a rat, you know, it's got a picture of a rat, so I guess it's about rats. Lots of rats in Sunderland. Can you confirm that, Mark? Uh, possibly. Oh. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, I don't need to know. I'll just ask. Oh, I've, I've, ne I've never been to Sunderland, so. Oh, you've never been to Sunderland? No. Have you ever been to Sunderland, Tim? No, no. We're the lads. Never been. Hey, easy on that. Away the rats. Away the rats. They're Mackhams. They will tell you they're not Geordies. You know, you just done a Geordie on them, haven't you? What, three months after this, I uh, I was back. Um, in fact, we stayed a night at it, it, uh, your place in uh, in, in Salford. Dot. Uh, me and her indoors. Um, it was the, the the time of the Olympics. I remember and, you coming over with her indoors then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, there was all that feel good factor of the Olympics and it did seem like a, like a magical moment in the context of the headlines that, that you've, that you've read out, especially that, you know, benefits, benefits thing. It's, this is my question really that I'm, I'm desperate to know from, from the pair of you, that Olympics thing, that magical moment, it seems to like be an anomaly. It wasn't really representative of what was happening. And in fact, what was happening, what was bubbling under, were more sinister forces. Is that, is that right? I think that ain't a bad um, reflection, because you're right, just two months after this, or maybe a month after it, we were in Olympic mode, where streets were blocked off, in, or parts of roads were blocked off in the capital to ensure that all these executives of the Olympic Committee could go from West London to East London without ever stopping at a traffic light, that kind of thing. And I think we put a pause on political differences, if that makes sense. It was a united time. I mean, you saw soldiers you know, squaddies actually helping to control the numbers of people at the Olympic Park and all this sort of stuff. And it was a real kind of like, oh, wow, squaddies can help people as well as shoot them, you know? It was kind of, whoa, you know, it was like, I've never seen that in a capital, really, squaddies like that. I'd seen it in Belfast um, during the Troubles and not for nice reasons either. And I think we did put a pause on it. I mean, when you read these headlines, there is no sense 
hear that in just a few months time, we will be welcoming the world to our uh, shores and to our capital city. Um, and we won't be talking about the EU. We won't be sticking it to people who are poorer or less fortunate than we are, et cetera, et cetera. EU leaders set for showdown on fate of Euro. That doesn't sound like a country that is ready to welcome the rest of the world. IVF clinics accused of putting money before safety. Oh, the other headline was The Guardian. This one is The Independent. And Miracle Manx, uh, well, the day after, obviously, they won it. This is um, uh, talking about this and that. It doesn't look like a country. 500,000 to lose disability benefit. There's a headline for you in the Daily Telegraph. That does not sound like a country that's going to spend 500 million or 1 billion or whatever the um, cost of the Olympics was. It doesn't sound like that. It sounds like we're still a country where poorer people or people who are less fortunate are pretty much on their knees. For me, Mark? Yeah, I remember going into the um, into the Olympics around that time. I, I was lucky enough to be working at Radio London where you were as well, Dotton. And um, the the kind of mood that I always felt was that we, we, we weren't really looking forward to the Olympics. It was almost like there was this hindrance about to take place. But then I remember as soon as the game started with that amazing opening ceremony, just the mood overnight changed. It was just the best time to be in London for that I can't, four weeks or whatever. And, and even going into the Paralympics, or maybe about a six or seven week period, it was, it was just incredible. Everyone was so kind to each other. There was, you know, I, I remember I'd go to work, I'd go partying for most of the night, go home, sleep for a couple of hours and go back to work. I didn't seem to be tired uh, any of it. And that's just, and everyone was just happy. And it, it was such a great moment and you know it's kind of like the the decade peaked early on and it kind of went a bit downhill um after that I second so the, everything that you said the, second that emotion all the way that, that was i wasn't here for the whole thing i was i was there for the start and i really felt that change of mood with the opening ceremony really felt it mm -hmm. um but with the hindsight the the, the the kind of youth riots of the previous year a much more representative, really, of, of the time, of the decade, than the Olympics, correct? I'm not sure about that. I think they were an anomaly. Um, I'm not saying that they didn't reflect um, a lot of angst, and particularly in terms of suspicion about uh, the police's behaviour towards black men. Uh, Mark Duggan, in this place, who got shot. And, um, you know, stories abounded about how much of a bad boy he was, you know, whether you want to accept those. He, he wasn't an angel. He wasn't an angel. Nevertheless, did he deserve to die? George Floyd, did he deserve to die? May not have been an angel, but it's kind of, that was a kind of a Black Lives Matter protest, at least initially. And then it just exactly. spurned into, a, you know, why riot? I want a riot. Why riot? A riot of my own. Black men got a lot of problems, but he knows how to throw a brick. Why people go to school? We're we'll teaching them how to be thick. And everybody's doing just what it's told to, but nobody wants to go to jail. Why riot? That really was what it was after like a, a day or two of uh, the riots. And then it kind of lost its meaning and its focus. I think it did have a place though. Um, what I remember most about that Olympic time was just that Super Saturday. I mean, I don't know if there's ever been, the great thing about the Olympics, it's kind of like the end of that season, which seemed to just be getting better and better and better. And the stakes just seem to be getting higher and higher and higher. And if you were a neutral fan, well, the excitement just never seemed to stop. That's the problem with this season that fizzled out. You want a season where actually we're pay, playing till the very last kick of the season. That for me sums up what the um, Olympics was about. It just got better and better and better and better. I mean, I had one, me and my family had one set of tickets for one single event, an event that none of us had ever experienced before, which was fencing. And we happened to be there on the day when a South Korean fencer decided to stage a protest on the ramp because she had been, you know, right, everybody saw yeah. that. You see, you're nodding. Yeah. Everybody saw yeah. that. We were there, mate. It couldn't get better than that. Imagine us going thinking, oh, what are we going to do first? That's the only tickets we got. Oh, well. And we happened to be there on the day that fencing actually became a huge uh, front page story. And news, it was the main story in the news, I think, or at least the main sporting story in the news was that woman. We were there, mate. It was, it was an amazing time. Who would you give a Brazilian shirt name to in that Man City team, Tim? And what would it be? Any ideas? Or? 
uh, I have no idea what her name would be, but I would give it to, to, to Jolene Lescott. Okay. Because his mistake changed the whole thing and it, it set up the incredible tension. So he, he's the man for making a mistake. He's the man we've got to thank for all of the drama. And I would give it to uh, Joey Barton because it was his sending off that certainly seemed to take the stuffing out of Man City. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry, it was one, one. Oh, out of QPR. Sorry, but it was it, it was one one when he got sent off. Yeah, but they scored one, a goal one. with ten men. They went ahead with ten men. Yeah, yeah. Having said that, could they have held on to that yeah. lead? You know, they were one man down. City knew that. And Joey Barton, got nothing against him personally, but, you know, he, he had those sort of uh, issues. He should have known that if I even motion towards an Argentinian's face, <laughs> even though I don't <laughs> touch him, the Argentinian yeah. is going down. I so, second that motion. Well, there you go. And his, um, his uh, Brazilian shirt name, I was tempted to go for Ploncarino, but that would be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. No, disrespectful to a player. It's not that. It's just, you know, he pulled one over your, you know, he pulled, what is it? What's the phrase? He pulled one over somebody's eyes? What was it? What's the phrase? Was pulled, pulled the wool? Yeah, okay. Um, he pulled the wool over your eyes in a messy. Yeah? Brazilian shirt name for me. How about you, Mark? What did you go for? Do you know who I'd go for? I'd go for the commentator. It was it Martin Tyler who, yeah. who gives us that moment? Because that's it, it's it's one of those moments where the commentary lives forever, right? Um, mm. And in 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 thirty, forty, fifty years time, there there'll be some museum somewhere, probably in Manchester, I'd imagine, and little kids will be staring at a screen, listening to that commentary, and that's what they'll remember about it, I suppose. And what would his Brazilian shirt name be off the top of your head? Probably just Aguero. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, gentlemen, thank you.